<laughs> hey guys, just trying to figure out how to share my screen. All right, I think I have it. One second. <laughs> okay, guys, I think I have it. It looks a little strange on my end because um, I can see my PowerPoint slides, but then on the camera, it looks like the PowerPoint slides are behind me. So um, hopefully um, this is right and it's recording correctly and you can cut all, out this first part. <laughs> but anyway, um, Hi, my name is Dr. Janice Stewart, and I am with Holistic Sports Medicine. As many of you know, I was with BJC up until last June, and I have since um, been working on, over the last year, opening up my own sports medicine practice with a little bit of primary care. So um, I am looking forward to getting that jumping, jumped off the ground shortly. Um, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. So um, let's get into it. The um, topic of my talk today is, can I use Mary Jane to relieve my pain? So our objectives, objectives for today are, we are going to talk about the endocannabinoid system. We're going to discuss the key components of the endocannabinoid system and how um, it maintains homeostasis. We will also discuss how cannabinoids like THC and CBD interact with the endocannabinoid system. We will discuss how the body senses pain, what causes inflammation, how we control pain and inflammation, the recovery and healing process, and the role of CBD, <clears throat> excuse me, and THC in the recovery and healing process. So cannabis. So when we hear cannabis, a lot of times the first thing we think about is THC. More recently, over several years, CBD has become popular. And um, there are actually other cannabinoids that can be used to treat different problems as well, which we'll bring up a little bit later. So as we all know, some of us consume cannabis products to get its mind-altering effects. But on the flip side of that, there is a large patient population out there that are actually seeking um, cannabis to use to treat their symptoms instead of the more addicting medications like narcotics, um, anti-anxiety medications, um, antidepressants, things like that. So just as we have our cardiovascular system, our nervous system, um, our endocrine system, our GI symptoms, all of those have receptors that respond to these different medications that are prescribed for us. We have another system within our body um, that is capable of interacting with THC and CBD. And that is our endocannabinoid system. That's exactly what it does. It interacts with THC and CBD. But it's not there just to allow us to enjoy the effects of the favorite strain of cannabis or CBD that we're trying. It does actually serve a vital purpose for our health and well being because it regulates key aspects of our biology. So what exactly does it do? In order to understand the endocannabinoid system, we must first understand a little bit about one of the most fundamental concepts in biology, homeostasis. Homeostasis is the concept that most biological systems are actively regulated to maintain conditions within a balanced range. So for example, our body doesn't want its temperature to, to be too hot or too cold, our blood sugar levels to be too high or too low, or our heart rate to be too fast or too slow. Conditions need to be just right for our cells to maintain optimum performance. 
The endocannabinoid system is a vital molecular system essential for bringing the body and its system, systems back into a balanced range. So some of the things that our endocannabinoid system regulates can be appetite, digestion, immune function, inflammation, including neuroinflammation, mood, sleep, reproduction and fertility, motor control, temperature regulation, memory, pain, pleasure, and reward. Once activated, the endocannabinoid system works only on the systems that are out of balance. So for example, if your reproductive hormones are out of whack, it will work to regulate them without altering your digestive system or your immune system. And once the endocannabinoids have done their job and brought the system back into balance, there are certain enzymes that come along to break them down and prevent them from going too far and upsetting the balance in the complete opposite direction which is where we just came from. We don't want that to happen. The key pieces of the endocannabinoid system, or ECS for short, are cannabinoid receptors, endocannabinoids, and metabolic enzymes. The cannabinoid receptors can be found on the surface of the cells. The endocannabinoids are actually small molecules that activate these receptors, and they are actually produced within the body itself. And then the metabolic enzymes break down these endocannabinoids after they're used. This is a kind of a busy slide um, and hopefully you can see my arrow or the hand, but this slide just indicates the two different types of receptors that um, are most studied, the CB1 and the CB2 receptors. These receptors sit on the surface of cells and they kind of listen to the conditions on the outside of the cell. They transmit information about the changing conditions on the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell, which then kickstarts the appropriate cellular response. The two major cannabinoid receptors are the CB1 and CB2 receptors. These aren't the only ones um, that do interact with cannabinoids, but they're the most studied. The CB1 receptors, as you can see in the picture on the body, um, are found mostly in the brain and the spinal column. And then the CB2 receptors are most abundant on the outside of the nervous system. So in places like the immune system, um, but both of them, the CB1 and the CB2 receptors can be found throughout the uh, body. The CB1 receptors are the ones that interact with THC and are the ones that allow you to get the high with the cannabis products. The endocannabinoids are molecules that bind to and activate the cannabinoid receptors. However, unlike THC, these endocannabinoids are produced naturally by the cells in the human body, endo meaning within as within the human body. The two major endocannabinoids are anandamide and 2-AG. These endocannabinoids are made from fat-like molecules within the cell membranes and they are made on demand. These are different than um, other hormones that typically are packaged and stored for later use, um, like our um, endocrine hormones, our uh, reproductive hormones, tr different transmitters in our body. Um, the endocannabinoids are made and used right at the time that they are needed, and then they get destroyed. Endocannabinoids can actually bind to either receptor, and the effect that um, results depends on where the receptor is located and which endocannabinoid binds to it. For example, the endocannabinoids might target CB1 receptors in the spinal nerve to relieve pain, while others may bind to the CB2 receptor in your immune cells to signal that your body is experiencing inflammation. In this picture, we have the um, enzymes, the metabolic enzymes destroying the cannabinoids. So the third piece of the endocannabinoid system includes the metabolic enzymes that quickly destroy endocannabinoids once they are used. The two major en enzymes that we know of are FAAH, which breaks down anandamide, and MAGL, which breaks down 2-AG. These enzymes ensure that endocannabinoids get used when they're needed, but not for any longer than necessary. This distinguishes, distinguishes the endocannabinoids from many other molecular signals in the body, such as hormones, which can persist for many seconds or minutes, or sometimes even days or get packaged and stored for later use. 
When someone smokes marijuana, a cannabinoid from the plant, either THC or CBD, attaches to the CB1 receptor in the brain, and if it's THC, it can create a high. The anandamide, one of your own endocannabinoids, also attaches to this same receptor. The reason anandamide does not get you high um, is because of the FAAH enzyme. Anandamide itself actually has a calming effect. That's why, um, that's, <laughs> sorry, that's why I kind of lost my train of thought. Uh, the reason anandamide doesn't get as high like THC does is due to the FAAH enzyme. So the THC kind of sticks around because the FAAH enzyme does not destroy it, whereas anandamide um, gives you that calming effect. FAAH, FAAH's job is actually to break down anandamide and other endocannabinoids. It works quickly on the ones your body creates, but it can't break down the THC. So that means THC sticks around for a lot longer and therefore has a much greater effect. Another plant-based cannabinoid that's getting a lot of attention, like I said before, is cannabidiol or CBD. It doesn't have any psychoactive properties, so its benefits come without the high of THC. And one known function of CBD in the brain is actually to stop the FAAH enzyme from breaking down anandamide so that anandamide can have more of an impact. That's why it's believed that CBD can treat many anxiety disorders. So the three components of the endocannabinoid system can be found almost everywhere in every major system of the body. When something brings a cell out of balance, these three pillars of the endocannabinoid system are often called upon to bring things back into homeostasis. Because of its role in helping bring things back to their physiological balance, the endocannabinoid system is often engaged when and where it's needed. So in this slide, we're looking at some brain cells. So the, these healthy brain cells in the upper left corner, um, the three purple circles, they communicate with each other by sending electrochemical signals to each other. Each neuron listens to its partners to decide whether it will fire off its own signal at any given moment. However, neurons do not like to get too much input. If they do, they get overloaded by signals and it can become toxic, which as we move forward to the picture on the right, we can see this angry neuron that's encircled in red with one of its receptors trying to trigger this next neuron with the exclamation point to do the same thing it's doing. So this is where endocannabinoids come in. This neuron is angry and upset. It's trying to recruit this neuron to do the same thing, but this neuron with the exclamation point releases endocannabinoids or stimulates the endo endocannabinoid system to release the uh, endocannabinoids. And what it does is it goes backwards and shuts down the angry neuron and tells it to be quiet. So then that brings everything full circle back up to the left-hand corner where everything is nice and normal and in balance. So again, we've got these healthy neurons kind of playing nice over here. One decides it wants to get angry and try and stimulate these other neurons to do the same thing. But one says, hey, we're not gonna do that because that makes the body uh, become out of balance. So what we're going to do is we're going to stimulate the endocannabinoid system to release the body's natural endocannabinoids. And what they do is they go backwards and tell this neuron that's already angry to hush up. It quiets down and then everything gets back into normal balance. In terms of inflammation, we know that inflammation is a natural protective reaction of the immune system when it has an infection or has been physically damaged. The purpose of inflammation is to remove the germs or damaged tissue. It's important that inflammation be limited to the location of the damage and doesn't spread or persist longer than needed because this can cause harm. Chronic inflammation and autoimmune, autoimmune diseases are examples of the immune system getting activated inappropriately. When that happens, the inflammatory response lasts for too long, which results in the chronic inflammation, or it gets directed towards healthy cells, which is also known as autoimmunity. Another busy slide, but this is um, a, an example of how infection can stimulate the endocannabinoid system. 
So in general, endocannabinoids seem to suppress or limit the immune system's inflammatory signals. In this example, we have a normal immune response triggered by some bacteria. So here we've got some immune cells that are nice and happy and healthy. Then in come these kind of green tadpole looking things to invade the healthy immune cells. These are the bacteria. Then one immune cell says, hey, wait a minute, we don't like this bacteria. We are going to stimulate the endocannabinoid system, which is all these little blue uh, diamond looking and circle looking um, spots to help come back stop the bacteria causing the inflammation, <clears throat> excuse me, and bring everything back into homeostasis like it was before. So the immune cells detect the presence of the bacteria. They release pro-inflammatory molecules that tell other immune cells to come and get into the fight. The endocannabinoids also get released and signal to the other immune cells for assistance to say, hey, hey, we don't need to have all this inflammation. Let's quiet down so the body can heal. And by tightly regulating inflammation, the immune system can destroy germs or remove damaged tissue and then stop. This prevents excessive inflammation, allowing cells in the body to return to homeostasis. There is this theory of um, endocannabinoid deficiency where the cannabinoid system is not properly working. This can be seen in fibromyalgia, migraine headaches, irritable bowel syndrome, these conditions tend to be resistant to most treatments and involve more than one system. We're still early in the process of figuring out how to correct endocannabinoid deficiency, but the increasing availability of medical marijuana and CBD products has been embraced by the patient community that have these different <clears throat> medical conditions, and we're likely to start seeing more research coming out in these areas. Different treatment potentials of CBD or cannabinoids. They're being researched as potential treatments for all kinds of conditions, not just those with endocannabinoid deficiency. Some of these include Alzheimer's disease, cardiovascular disease, neurological and neurodegenerative disease like Parkinson's, um, neurodevelopment and psychiatric illnesses, acute and chronic kidney disease, autoimmune diseases, chronic inflammatory diseases, and chronic pain conditions. CBD and THC actually are already in use, um, particularly for pediatric epilepsy, some pain and inflammatory conditions, um, and acne. How does the CBD interact with the endocannabinoid system? Unlike THC, CBD does not get you high, as I've stated before, and typically does not cause any negative side effects. Experts aren't completely sure how CBD interacts with the endocannabinoid system, but they do know that they do not bind with the CB1 and CB2 receptors the way THC does. Many believe it works by preventing endocannabinoids from being broken down, and this allows them to have more of an effect on your body, and then others believe that CBD binds to a receptor that has yet been discovered. While the details of how it works are still under debate, Research does suggest that it can help with pain, nausea, and other symptoms associated with other medical conditions, such as anxiety, um, depression, et cetera. How does THC interact with the endocannabinoid system? So THC, or tetrahydrocannabinol, is one of the main cannabinoids found in cannabis. It's the component that gets you high. Once in your body, THC interacts with the endocannabinoid system by binding to the receptors, just like the endocannabinoids do. It's powerful partly because it can bind to both CB1 and CB2 receptors. This allows it to have a range of effects on your mind and your body, some more desirable than others. For example, THC can help to relieve, reduce pain and inflammation and stimulate your appetite. So those that are, um, experiencing some anorexia for medications, cancer, et cetera, THC can actually stimulate the appetite. That's what you kind of classically hear people say they have the munchies when they smoke marijuana. This um, does have a positive effect on those that are, are experiencing anorexia for whatever reason, because it can stimulate the appetite. But on the flip side, it can also cause paranoia and anxiety in some cases and with certain strains. So those patients that suffer from anxiety or bipolar or schizophrenia, some cannabis um, strains have been shown to make these symptoms worse. 
Experts are currently looking into ways to produce synthetic THC actually um, to interact with the endocannabinoid system only in beneficial ways and so that you don't have these unwanted side effects. So when it comes to sports medicine and injuries, um, of course, the most common things that we see are sprains and strains, fractures, torn ligaments and tendons, concussion, overuse injuries, joint dislocations, biomechanical injuries, arthritis resulting from any number one of these conditions. And most of them start with inflammation, which is the normal response of your body's immune system to injuries and harmful things that enter it. And when your body encounters an offending agent or suffers an injury, it activates your immune system which then sends out as first responders, the inflammatory cells and cytokines. This inflammation can be acute or it can be chronic. And the five signs of inflammation, as we know, are pain, heat, redness, swelling, and loss of function. In this picture, this is just a kind of a simplified version of the inflammation cascade because getting involved in all the interleukins and everything that is just taking me back to med school where we had to learn all that. So this is simplified where here we see some skin that has been disrupted by a wound. And we have all of these little bacteria entering the wound, stimulating the immune system, which releases from the, the uh, blood vessels, all of the first responders. So the mast cells, the platelets, the neutrophils, uh, macrophages down here in purple, all of those are released to help try and stop the inflammation. Acute inflammation can occur from an injury or infection or being exposed to a substance like a bee sting or a chemical. And again, chronic inflammation can be exposure to chemicals. It can be autoimmune like lupus, Hashimoto's, type 1 diabetes, autoinflammatory like Bichette's disease or familial Mediterranean fever or FMF. It can be persistent acute inflammation, or it can be a hypersensitivity to an external trigger, like with allergies. The goals of treatment are to correct, control, or slow down the disease process, whether it's infection, cancer, an injury. We avoid or change any activities that aggravate the pain. We ease pain through medications such as anti-inflammatory drugs, sometimes narcotics. And the big question is, can we replace these medicines that have harmful side effects with CBD or THC that actually do not have these addicting or harmful side effects? We like to keep the joint movement and muscle strength through physical therapy, and we lower the stress on joints by using braces, splints, canes, or uh, crutches as needed. And again, we use the price method, price method, protection, pain control, rest, ice, elevation, I have this question mark by ice because there's, you know, depending on what you read, there's a theory that says, no, you shouldn't use ice to control the inflammation. You should just let it come around because the swelling allows all the healing factors to come to the area to help it heal. And others say, no, that, that swelling is harmful. So we need to put ice on it and calm everything down. So there's kind of two schools of thought on that. Um, in terms of the medicines that we use to help with the pain, NSAIDs, these are some of the harmful side effects, stomach pain, heartburn, stomach ulcers, a tendency to bleed more, especially if you're on blood thinners or aspirin, headaches and dizziness. Um, a lot of times we hear, especially people with migraines that are constantly taking ibuprofen or Aleve, uh, well, can get a rebound headache. So taking it persistently for days and weeks on end can it cause headaches. Ringing in the ears, allergic reactions, such as rashes, wheezing, throat swelling, can cause kidney dysfunction over time. And those with a, those patients with high blood pressure can actually increase the blood pressure. Or if you do not have high blood pressure and all of a sudden you do, and you're taking any anti-inflammatory medications, this could be the cause. Tylenol can cause nausea, stomach pain, loss of appetite, itching, rash, play colored stools, liver dysfunction, headache, dark urine, and our narcotics, such as hydrocodone, oxycodone, morphine, tramadol, hydromorphone, hydromorphone, fentanyl, these can cause sedation, dizziness, nausea, vomiting, constipation, respiratory depression, tolerance, physical dependence and addiction, and ultimately death if abused. So when we look at pain, we look at pain, the pain pathway. We have the brain, the spinal cord, and then the sensory and motor neurons. 
By definition, pain is an uncomfortable feeling that tells you something is wrong. The different types of pain are nociceptive pain, neuropathic pain, and then you can have a mixed picture. So with nociceptive pain, there's a stimulation of specific pain receptors. You respond to the heat, cold, vibration, stretching, chemical stimuli when tissues are irritated or injured. This can occur in sprains and strains, fractures, contusions, obstruction, burns, dislocations, versus the neuropathic pain, which causes damage and dis dysfunction to the nervous system itself. So like with multiple sclerosis, it could be widespread dysfunction, or sometimes it can be challenging to um, find the initial cause, such as in RSD or re reflux sympathetic dystrophy. It can also be a mixed picture of the two, where initially the injury can trigger inflammation, which then leads to burning, throbbing, tingling, numbness, swelling, color changes of the skin. So it can start out as nociceptive and then kind of progress into a neuropathic picture. In terms of recovery and healing, I like to talk to my patients kind of on a whole body level. So while yes, we have this physical injury or this infection that's limiting them, we also need to take into consider their mental health, hydration, nourishment, and sleep. So mentally, when we talk about our athletes um, being injured and having to miss sports, especially you know at the college level or kids that have been playing since they were five, all through high school, um, in grade school, when they're taken out, this um, can really affect them mentally because they're so used to going, 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 playing and practicing, winning and all kinds of things. So we really need to kind of talk to them about their, their mental health surrounding the injury and them having to miss any of their competition. This can be done with counseling or with speaking with their pastor. Hydration, definitely hydration when kids are dehydrated or athletes are de dehydrated anybody is dehydrated. You can get fatigue, um, lightheadedness, dizziness, they're not playing up to par, etc. I have alkaline water here because that's really kind of become popular over the years as well. It with the theory that alkaline water changes the inside pH of the body to more alkaline instead of acidic because acidic um, environments are what breeds infection and allows things to uh, get bad. In terms of nourishment, we definitely like well-balanced meals, try to eliminate or decrease inflammatory foods such as red meats, refined carbs, sweetened drinks, gluten, and try foods that help fight inflammation like turmeric, omega, omega fatty acids, berries, green leafy vegetables, nuts, and then sleep. Sleep is super important. This is where the magic happens. Hormones and antibodies are produced, muscle repair occurs, hunger hormones are regulated. So those of us that like to stay up night, late at night and snack, this is actually throwing off your hunger hormones, which then causes you to gain weight. I've found a lot of my patients, if I can get them to sleep better, they find that their workouts um, are a lot more productive, they have more energy and the weight comes off faster. The brain stores new information, gets rid of the body, gets rid of toxic waste, cellular repair occurs, the heart rate and blood pressure decrease, allowing your heart and blood vessels to rest. And again, the endocannabinoid system, the CB1 and CB2 receptors, CB1 found mostly within the, the brain and the, the central nervous system, where CB2 receptors are found mostly in the extremities with the other systems, the immune systems, the lungs, vascular system, musculoskeletal system, etc. Then you have your two endocannabinoids, 2-AG and anandamide. So how do we use CBD and THC in recovery and healing? So as we talked about, sleep is important. So instead of using some of the addictive sleep aids or over-the-counter melatonin, which can cause people to feel drugged or dragged the next day, you can use CBD to help. Um, it can help in pain control, can help with burning, numbness, and tingling, especially if applied topically. Inflammation, um, it's very helpful for scar tissue, wound healing, and the upside to it, it's no addictive properties. There's no harmful side effects. THC, if that is used, has the potential to cause a high. Um, this does depend on how much you're using and how, you know, the timing of when you're using it. Um, and just kind of a caveat, I know my audience is high school athletic trainers and, um, 
there is an anti-drug policy at the high school level, um, actually most grade levels, including college. Um, but hopefully over time, that will change. Just slowly it's changing in all sports at all different levels. But particularly um, if anything gets uh, allowed to be used first, it likely will be CBD. You can actually find CBD without any THC in it. Um, Over-the-counter CBD that you see in a lot of the stores, unless it says THC free has 0.03, I'm sorry, 0.3% um, THC in it. So that's the minimum legal allowance of TJ, THC to be used in CBD that's bought over the counter. Some of the issues I find with a lot of CBD products and why it's not working for people is that um, even though the bottle says there's this amount of CBD in it, unless there's lab testing to back it up and follow it, and you can actually look at it, some of the products actually don't have the amount that it says on the bottle and maybe mostly oil or waters or some other fillers for it. So um, if you have any athletes coming to you asking about CBD, um, this could be part of the issue as to why it's not working. But hopefully things will change and we can um, start using it. Even if it's a CBD THC free product, it does still work. The different forms of CBD and THC are topical. You can inhale it, such as smoking a, um, like a cigarette or a vape. Tinctures, which are oils you can put under the tongue, edibles, or any combination of these forms. Um, the onset of relief for topicals is typically 10 to 15 minutes locally, wherever it's applied. If you inhale it pretty quick within 10 to 20 minutes, a little longer for tinctures and edibles. Tinctures that's, that comes as an oil is about 15 to 30 minutes versus an edible that you chew um, or drink. So it could be a drink, it could be chocolate, a lollipop, gummies, whatever. The onset of the, that relief of those symptoms is about 30 to 60 minutes. So as I mentioned early on in, in the talk, there are other cannabinoids other than THC and CBD. These two are the most popular. Um, THC can relieve pain, inflammation, nausea, and increase the appetite. CBD also can help relieve pain, helps with seizures, anxiety, depression, and nausea. But there are several other cannabinoids that are also found in the cannabis plant that do have some beneficial properties. So THCB can help with weight loss, anxiety, PTSD, and diabetes, CBDV, uh, helps with seizures and anti-inflammatory properties. CBG helps with skin and gut and, and has very good antifungal properties. I like CBG for my patients that have like gastritis or reflux, um, have Crohn's or any inflammatory bowel disease, irritable bowel. CBG works really well for. CBC helps with pain and inflammation. I love CBN for um, sleep. It's it, it really helps well with insomnia. It also helps people get more quality sleep. It can also help improve the appetite and relieve pain. THCA is actually non-psychoactive and it has good anti-inflammatory properties and helps with nausea. CBDA also is non-psychoactive and helps with inflammation and nausea. And then CBGA again helps with the gut. And all of these different ones can be found um, in particular in THC products. You can find some of these other ones like CBG, um, CBN, CBC over the counter by themselves or in combination with CBD. So um, those are available as well. And then one other thing that you may or may not have heard about, but terpenes. So terpenes are super important as well when we're talking about cannabinoids. These are found in the essential oils of plants. So that's what gives the plant or the flower its fragrant smells. And all of these um, can be found in different amounts in different products and can be helpful for different things. So the combination of the cannabinoids with the terpenes are what um, most doctors are looking for when we're educating our patients on what and how much they should use of CBD and THC products. It's not just about the THC or the CBD. It's a combination of everything to help provide relief. So like myrcene, it can be found in hops and lemongrass, bay leaves, thyme, and eucalyptus. Um, this helps with pain relief and inflammation. 
Linalool is a common one. Most people know it as lavender, but it can be found in lavender, citrus, mint. Um, works great as an anti-inflammatory, has a calming effect, um, and helps with anxiety. Limonene is found in citrus rinds, helps with nausea, pain relief, focus. It's a great anti-inflammatory and really um, works well in cardiovascular systems, so it can help lower blood pressure. Pinene, find in, found in pine and fir. It works well as an anti-inflammatory, pain relief, and focus. Caryophylline, you find it in black pepper, hops, cloves, and works as an anti-inflammatory and pain relief. Humulene, I found also in, in hops, black pepper, and cloves. Again, it's great as a topical anti-inflammatory. And then osamine, found in honeybees, helps with inflammation. So where is CBD and THC um, use in sports? Where are we now? Today, um, the NCAA, as of February 25th of this year, has relaxed the amount of THC to trigger a positive test. So it went from 35 nanograms to 150 nanograms, and there's less stringent penalties if they do come back positive higher than the 150 nanograms. And the chief medical officer of the NCAA actually said pot is, quote, unquote, not considered a performance-enhancing drug. WADA, um, the World Anti-Doping Association, still considers cannabis banned during competitive season. So we saw that um, over this past year with the Olympics. The NBA no longer randomly drug tests for THC, <clears throat> excuse me, through 2022, but I do expect that to extend um, into 2023 and beyond. The NFL and NFL Players Association um, allows their athletes to use cannabis in the off season. The NHL uh, found no punishment for positive tests. So anyone that pops positive for um, THC that plays in the NHL, there will be no repercussions for them. Major League Baseball has actually removed THC from the banned substance list and Major League Soccer still follows the WADA recommendations. So in summary, um, we talked about how your body senses pain through the nervous system, the sensory and motor pathways. We talked about inflammation, how it occurs um, when there is an injury or harmful things in, enter the body, how we can control inflammation by the things we consume, appropriate time to rest, recover, and heal, and by medication, prescription, over-the-counter, or natural. Recovery and healing um, should address the physical, mental, nutritional, and sleep aspects. And we also talked about CBD and or THC and how it can play a role in recovery and healing without the side effects of prescription medications and the associated high of THC if dosed and used as directed. What I did uh, unfortunately fail to put on here, we also talked about what the endocannabinoid system is, how it works, what the enzymes do and the role of the receptors with the endocannabinoids produced by the body versus THC, the cannabinoids um, of THC and CBD and how they affect the body. So these are my references that I used for my talk today, up to date, Mayo Clinic, Leafly, Sleep Foundation, US News and World Report. And if anybody has any questions after this presentation, they can always call me at 314-257. 0060 or reach out to me at info at holisticsportsmedicine.com.